I'd like to request all of you to please uh, welcome our panelists onto the stage as uh, I invite them up. Shrikant uh, Shastri, uh, President, Thai Delhi. Dilip Mangsuli, Executive Director, Siemens Healthineers. Raja Lehri, a partner, Grant Thornton. Karima Prakash, Deputy Manager, Public Policy, NASCOM. We'll have the launch of the report, Fueling Entrepreneurship Survey and Policy Recommendation, followed by the panel discussion and uh, moderating the panel discussion will be Ashish Agarwal, Vice President and Head of Policy, NASCOM. I'd like to now hand the mic over to Garima. Thank you everyone for being here. I'm Garima Prakash, part of the policy team at NASCOM. Uh, I would like to invite our panelists to, um, to kindly release the report titled Fueling Entrepreneurship, Startup Survey and Policy Recommendations. I will also request Sridhar to please quickly join us on stage and help with the launch. And I will request the photographer to please click a picture. Hold the report with me. Thank you, panelists. I would just like to take a moment to mention that the report is also live on a NASCOM website, nascom.in. You just have to scroll to the latest at NASCOM section and you'll find the report. I would like to also acknowledge the contribution by our partners, Grant Thornton Bharat and Thai Delhi NCR for the report. Especially, I would like to mention Sushnato, Sridhar and Geetika and team for their contribution for the report. Thank you so much, partners. Um, as the title suggests, the report uh, covers findings of the survey conducted by us where we asked questions to startups and investors on the challenges and enablers for them in the ecosystem. So the findings, the key findings suggest that access to capital is the biggest challenge as well as the biggest enabler for startups in India, especially for early stage startups. And for others, ease of doing business norms also take prominence. For investors, uh, we found out that limitations on investing in Indian origin startups that are headquartered overseas and have a step down subsidiary in India or operations in India is the biggest challenge. I'm also happy to note that this limitation has actually very recently been relaxed by the government and regulators. So the government is listening to startups and, and the policy issues therein. Um, in terms of choice of funding, private equity and venture capital emerged as the top funding choices for startups. And um, when asked about public listing, 5% of the respondents selected domestic listing, while 6% selected overseas listing. So this is all about the key findings of the survey. I will now move on to the recommendations that our report makes. We believe that the government can play a vital role in addressing the challenges we just mentioned by amending relevant laws and in creating enabling policies. Accordingly, we make the following rec recommendations in the report. The tax rate applicable on long-term capital gains arising out of investments in startups made by resident investors should be harmonized with the applicable tax rate on investments by non-resident investors. Moreover, this harmonization of tax rate should also occur for capital gains derived out of investments in listed versus unlisted companies in India. We also recommend that the government can create more market opportunities for startups by procuring from them through a grand challenge mode and also creating more awareness among startups about the procurements made and publishing data around procurements so that there is enough information and there's enough aware awareness in the ecosystem that significant market opportunities are being created by the government. The government should also support creation of industry-led innovation clusters that drive innovation in collaboration with startups in academia. And we believe that this co-creation is the way forward for the entire ecosystem to flourish. Um, with, res res with respect to enabling access to capital at the listing stage, we recommend that direct overseas listing should be operationalized by notifying the permissible jurisdictions and types of securities that can be listed on overseas stock exchanges. All Indian companies, instead of only listed Indian companies, should be permitted to list on overseas stock exchanges. With this overview in mind, we would like to get into a panel discussion to deliberate deeper into these recommendations. And accordingly, I would like to hand over to Ashish to 
begin the panel discussion. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Garima, and uh, uh, glad to be here after three years in this session. And uh, of course, um, uh, we are on this important topic and we have a short window of time. So uh, Raja, let me come straight to you. Um, while I'm coming to the NPC after now three years, but the issue is, uh, I think, older than four years. Um, overseas uh, listing, direct overseas listing, it hasn't happened. So uh, we know that it's a great environment for startups in terms of being uh, raising funds and so on and so forth. But if you look at overseas lift, uh, listing, you look at the SPAC listing mechanism um, and all of that, I think, uh, to be fair, as Garima mentioned, some stuff has been done. Even outside of equity now, just now, credit guarantee scheme for DPIT startups has come up where you can get 10 crores worth of you know, uh, lending. Hopefully, uh, banks will be more willing. But just when you look at this uh, in terms of options for startups, how important this has been that uh, uh, last four years have gone and we haven't seen much headway in, and, and what do you see in this entire space? Sure. So thanks, Ashish. Uh, first of all, afternoon, everybody. Uh, <clears throat> I think, uh, you know, what a thrilling panel it was, the previous panel. And uh, just taking a cue from what Rajan said, he basically said two important things, right? So one is how capital is the lifeblood of any, any startup or any business. And second is build really high quality companies. Now, if you look at the report, it very clearly comes out that the biggest enabler or the biggest challenge for any startup is capital, very clearly. Now, the second part of your question is really around overseas listing, right? Now, if you look at capital, and we are talking about a time which is post-COVID, things have changed. We feel that it is remote, and yet we are globally connected. But if you look at the landscape for Indian companies, Indian tech companies, startup companies, just to give you some data point, Ashish, there are not more than 15 companies from India which are listed overseas. That's it. We've talked about the Infosys, Wipros of the world, but remember, th those were in 2000s. We are 20 years hence. And even the GDPR ADR route is no longer that attractive. And the GDPR AD hmm. ADR route is no longer attractive. If you look at some of our competition, I, I, and if I may say, globally, China has 300 companies listed in the US stock exchanges. We have 15, just repeating that. Now, if today, given the current landscape, we see the pivot to India, which is the third largest ecosystem, the startup destination in the world, can this 15 be 100 in the next 10 years? We believe it should be. Because today, you're not, com you're not building companies just for India, you're building companies for the globe. If you, if you take that thesis, then very clearly, we need to think capital sources outside India. Two points again, from a private equity standpoint, most of the capital is anyway the international capital which is fueling the startup journey. So, which means that for their exits, for the startup founders to really scale up, you need the overseas listings to come in. What are the challenges? Very clearly, the challenges is, is that in the last two years, in my view, it has been a huge miss. $200 billion of capital was raised in the US capital markets through IPO and SPAC route. You can have a look at the SPAC kind of story. There is $140 billion of SPAC capital today, Ashish, which is waiting to find a target. Okay, okay, so I think we get that. Uh, but uh, tell me, uh, government is probably only saying that uh, uh, let's go for dual listing. So uh, uh, what's the problem with that? The, it's not a problem, I guess, as you said, ask the question, it's an option, number one. Today, what is the regulation? You've got to first list in India, and then you can list overseas. The direct overseas listing, which the government kind of said a couple of years back, that you need not do that. You can directly access capital overseas, which means that that's an option. You're absolutely right. You can list both places, but the cost of raising that capital, the cost of doing all of that is significant. Absolutely. So I think, uh, Raja, your point well made. Uh, so overseas listing is something that we are hoping that the government will finally come through with it. And, 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 and that should really open up, uh, given the entire uh, uh, environment right now from a funding space. Having as many options as possible is probably the thing which the government can do. Um, Shringal, I know you have a flight to catch immediately, but I, I'm hoping that you'll, you'll finish this session. Uh, uh, 
just in terms of, you know, we talked about uh, foreign listing. But then uh, the way the policy is playing out, we are also tying uh, uh, ourselves in knots by making it difficult for domestic investors, in some sense, uh, to have the same uh, potential post-tax ROI uh, when it compares to the uh, foreign investors. And it's playing out not only in terms of, you know, the uh, tax rate between uh, domestic investor and foreign investor, and within the domestic scenario between listed companies and unlisted. And again, um, uh, you have been seeing this space for long. Uh, is it really a concern for startups, or, or it's more something from a country perspective where it really takes importance? So these tax differences have been around for years, but it did not matter once upon a time. I sold two businesses about 10 years ago. Uh, I thought that I would be taxed at 10% for the money I was getting, and I'd made plans to spend that money. How's here? I'll invest in there, invest in that. And suddenly my CA gives me a shock and says, no, unlisted security, you got to pay 20%. So it didn't matter in those days because the amounts were much smaller. Mm. The number of startups who got exits were fewer. But what's changed now is that many more startups are getting exits and capital gain becomes a real issue. There's so much more money at stake. When Flipkart gets sold to Walmart at $18 billion, so many people are going to pay tax, and that 10% makes a huge difference, actually. That's the way to look at it. So I think what's happening today is because of this discrepancy between the tax rules for domestic and foreign investors and capital gains in listed and unlisted securities, it's hurting startup founders, it's hurting investors, it's hurting our country. Let me try and explain this. As a startup founder, what's happening today is Many of the startups I mentor, and I'm going to take the risk of taking this name, uh, got offers from Y Combinator. Now, that is an aspirational name for many early stage startups. Although you get only $500,000, it's aspirational. But YC insists you have to list your, uh, re your holding company has to be registered in US. So the founders scramble to reverse the structure. Holding company becomes US. Subsidiary company becomes India. They spend a lot of time and energy. And in one particular startup, they got this 500K from YC. When they were trying to raise a Series A, a domestic fund was interested in investing but said, I won't invest in a US entity. So they said, let me reverse it once again. So the amount of time and effort you waste in managing the process is often not worth it. Second is, I've set up my own companies in the US. I know compliance is a pain. I know of a well-known startup founder who said, I will not list my company in US because if ever I'm hauled up for compliance, I'd rather go to a jail in India than go to a jail in the US. So compliance in US is onerous, actually. So for founders, it's painful. But if there's no other option, you've got to take money from US, go ahead and take it. But it is hurting many founders for the amount of time they waste on this. It's hurting investors because unlike five years ago, Angel investing has spread across the country. Every small town in India has an angel network now. It's hard for those people to invest in an overseas entity. You're governed by your LRS scheme. Within that, you've got to invest. If that startup has a step-down subsidiary in India, sometimes you've got to take special uh, for approvals in advance from RBI. So you're excluding a lot of domestic angel investors from investing opportunities. So it's hurting investors. Finally, it's hurting the country. When you, because of these tax differences, if a startup is, for, is forced to headquarter in the US, the wealth creation is happening in US or Singapore. It's not happening in India. It's hurting us as a country. So I think it's good that we're talking about it, good that an, uh, this report is making a recommendation, because we need to clean up this act because it's hurting all three stakeholders. So actually. typically when the incentives are aligned, then you've, it's easy to find a solution. The fact that it's hurting everybody and still we don't have a solve, I mean, uh, so the problem is that, uh, like we saw in the entire discussion on angel taxation, that uh, the, the, the idea that it might be abused in some sense. And we found a solution which is pretty much, I can say, maybe yeah. it's working, right? So, uh, so uh, what's the, in your mind, you know, uh, we discussed about it, but it would be good to say that what should be the expectation for the industry that if it were to be get solved, what, what is the price or what will it entail in terms of the solution? So I had a close friend who was the former revenue secretary in the finance ministry some years ago. And I asked him once, why do you make life so complicated for us common people? He says because there are so many people trying to break the rules. 
And therefore, if I make it uniform and reduce the capital gains in India to 10%, I know some people will break the system. They may not be startups, but they will still create a shell company and all of that. So I, I, my discussion with him was, look, you can always find a way to do a certain amount of due diligence. Is this a genuine startup or not? Just because you don't want to make the effort of differentiating between a genuine startup and a non-genuine startup, you're creating a harsh rule for everyone across the board. So it requires a little bit of mindset change. Uh, I think the good news is, who would have expected the government in India to be so supportive with programs like Startup India? Pre-2015, 16, we couldn't have imagined it. Yeah. I think it's a question of time, and I think with policy recommendations like this, things will change. Yeah, hopefully, I think the DPIT registered startup is one way to go ahead with it. So, but just to sum up on these two points, I think the overseas listing is something which probably I'll be a little more confident will happen sooner than later. And the taxation bit, I think it's a little bit more complex in terms of getting to that end, end goal that we want, but I think we are working on this. Um, but with that, let me come to Dilip, because um, in the startup ecosystem, when we think of policy space, we don't want for policy things to happen for us to be able to do something, right? Policy space should matter maybe 5%, and that's where our expectation should be. So there's a lot which can uh, and is happening within the ecosystem itself. And there again, the role of the government has been good. So uh, I'm talking about co-creation market opportunities where companies can uh, get real business, uh, can therefore uh, partner with uh, uh, a larger ecosystem, and then in that sense, you know, uh, strengthen their business model. So we know Karnataka has an innovation uh, society, Maharashtra has it, uh, and, and railway, uh, we work with railway to come up with a policy where they invite startups to pitch solutions to their problems, and you bypass the entire uh, traditional procurement route. And even the procurement policies have been relaxed, but that's again government side. So uh, Dilip, within the industry, I mean, uh, you have had some great experience in healthcare in terms of uh, uh, working with startups and using that as a kind of an example. Uh, can you talk about what's the opportunity and what startups need to do if they want to get into this co-creation, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, ecosystem? I think um, Rajan said something that uh, stuck with me. He talked about early startups as well as the late startups. Early star startups, he talked about, you know, how do you create a brilliant product, right? The product that's going to really make an impact. And of the late startups, he talked about the revenue generation. How do you make that happen? And if I think about the last few years, how things have changed, and how even the large corporations have started looking at startups as a way and means of really creating a faster products to market. Uh, digital has changed the world. And India being the capital of uh, knowledge center and digital center, I think a number of startups who have started really creating products, uh, creating from idea into uh, a concept which actually can work, has really multi multiplied in uh, many ways. In healthcare itself, I have seen, uh, you know, if I think about what we are trying to do as a large company, uh, we're trying to look at how do we move from a disease management to a wellness management in the long run. And to do that, I think you need to really look at developing so many solutions at a disease level, at a you know, micro level. And for these kind of solutions to be created for large corporations, it's going to be impossible in one go. And here is where you know, I see the startups really bringing in their might the speed, agility, uh, innovation capabilities. Uh, you know, 2017 time frame, when I was part of GE Healthcare, uh, we launched the cohort for uh, startups to bring in uh, startups into the mainstream because I think one of the challenges that startups face is how do you get the market access? Uh, India alone is not a biggest market. In fact, India, if you look at it, it's hardly a 5% of the global market on the healthcare side. I'm just trying to take example of healthcare, but it uh, replicates in multiple areas as well, uh, except financial uh, transactions, where probably India beats everyone. Uh, so with India being the starting point, how do you create the access for all these startups to global market is where the companies, large companies, bring that might. Uh, what startups bring is the agility, like I said. 
the speed of creating the concepts. Do you want to contextualize the uh, scenario in India in terms of co-creation with you know, what you are seeing in some of the other developed countries and so that you get a sense of, you know, what's the opportunity which is very near term and available? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, you know, if I think about it, uh, now I'll give examples of uh, during the COVID times, right, how some of the companies in India created very quick solutions for COVID detection. Now, how do you engage these startups to really bring them into mainstream? And here is where some of these companies, you know, GE Healthcare or Siemens, uh, they did in bringing these uh, concepts into uh, workable solutions in the global marketplace. Uh, these plus even uh, during the same time, I think a lot of cancer related solutions and report generation, uh, quick uh, intelligence creation, AI based detection, that was the need of the hour and these were created with a platform coming from large companies. Absolutely, absolutely Dilip. I think the message here is that while access to capital and government policies are going to play out as they will, and there has clearly been intent from the government side to fix some of these issues, and some of these issues remain. On the side of co-creation, I think there's an immense opportunity. NASCOM and other industry bodies are also working with state government, center, and there is an ecosystem within us uh, as industry where a lot of uh, it can be leveraged to uh, grow the business models. So I think we are pretty much at the end of time in this session, and, 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 and really there's a lot more to discuss. So one, I would definitely request all of you to look at our report. It's a starting place. It's a, it's a point to start the conversation on some of these issues in a more structured manner. And before we leave, uh, I want to quickly ask each of the panelists, given this, uh, nobody's talking about the great numbers of 2022, while everybody is talking about 2021 numbers, and given the investment climate for founders who are looking to raise money, um, what is that one message you have, uh, whether it's from the policy uh, perspective or, or just about their own journey, and probably start with you, Shrikant. Yeah. So while NASCOM, TAI, all of us lobby the government to improve the tax structure, core message to founders is take money wherever you get it from, as long as it's not Chinese money, and take it sooner rather than later. <laughs> all right. Uh, uh, Dilip, any comment from you? Well, I think from uh, my side, I would say use the ecosystem that is available. I think the large companies are available to partner and provide a lot of data, a lot of uh, uh, mentorship, as well as a lot of expertise and a vehicle for uh, reaching the larger markets. Utilize that. Uh, there are, no one is shy of uh, working with startups. In fact, it is, they are working with the startups at a one-to-one -one or a equal level, not at a, I am the big Great. guy, you are a small guy. I mean, they are treating them at an equal level, and you should really look at partnering. And almost every large company is looking at that. Great. So within NASCOM, you have that entire ecosystem of enterprise and startups. Let's leverage that. Uh, Raja, last word. No, I think uh, <clears throat> first is, I think, think big uh, and build a solid business model, number one. And second, I've always said any founder, any company looking for funding, is prepare, prepare, prepare. There's no short of preparation. Prepare, because that's the lifeline of business. Never forget that. All right. Thank you. Uh, I hope we are not too late on time. And thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We'd like to thank our panelists.